Hello. Hama retwa jitago grace ke foi na goko gwa chano eno twara gi horo atu nya motuni ni twe moyo tutaura gwo mingi ni shiumbe. Na dairo iria shido de ka gashiga shia mere ito. Kwe shiria do ige mo ka goko gwa chano eno ni mere ga komenya. Mwarimo wa ono. Kugo umode do ga te noma ka juke na nyone kane na geiranie. Jeo kane mo ga ide ko umode. Kwa video eno Kweda kwari ohoro wa maudu matatu. Kia bere, jeda kwari ohoro wa kurea chano eno yumete. Ia kere, jeda kwari ya ohoro wa kirea deru tete kukugwa chano eno. Na kedu ya gata tu jeda kwari ohoro wa kurea diresi ya chano eno irafi. As you can tell, I am still learning how to speak the Gikuyo language well. So, in today's video, we are going to talk in English. But then hopefully... In the next few years, I will be able to develop my comfort and ability to speak in Gekuyo confidently on camera. But today, we will speak in English. Let's jump in. This conversation is going to be broken down into 10 reflections. And I have all of these reflections written down on note cards right here. And so what we're going to do is go through these note cards one at a time to help me guide the conversation. Reflection number one. So this reflection card has to do with where we started. So this channel started primarily because I wanted to speak to my grandparents in the Gekuyo language about the coronavirus. So as you remember, at the very start of the coronavirus, scientists were learning so much new information in such a short span of time. And so I remember wondering whether my grandparents had access to some of the information that was being discussed and that was being developed. For context, at the start of the COVID pandemic, I was a PhD student in cell and molecular biology. And so cells and molecules are of very, very great interest to me. And so unsurprisingly, a new virus was of very much interest. And so as we were learning, I wanted to know how are other people learning and how are other people learning across access and language barriers? And so in my case, I thought about my grandparents who live in Kenya, in central Kenya, and who primarily speak the language of Gikuyu. Gikuyu is one of about 40 plus languages in Kenya. And I remember just wondering to what extent is some of this information being dispersed? A quick search to help me understand this question revealed that there were some gaps in terms of the molecular details that people were discussing. And so then I decided that this would be a great growth opportunity for me to learn how to talk and describe basic biology in my mother tongue. And the aim of putting this on YouTube was number one, to be able to distribute it easily to my family members, and then number two, to hopefully encourage other scientists who are interested in learning their mother tongue or who are interested in communicating their concepts in their mother tongue to do the same. If you look on the popular channel Rekeshime Nene in August of 2020, you will find a lesson about coronavirus. And that was me. The reason I pitched that organization is because I recognized that some of this information had wider reaching interest perhaps. And I'm really, really grateful that they gave me the opportunity to speak on their platform to their audience. And the response was really encouraging. And if you actually look at the date that that video was published and the starting date of this channel, they are one and the same because it is that process that encouraged me to keep growing in this direction. And so I'm really, really grateful that they gave me that opportunity. And I'm really grateful to be here today and to look at the way that I have grown and learned in the last few years. Okay, so this is reflection card number two. And on this card, I am reflecting about how I've moved and how I've grown so far. So since I started the channel, I have made about 40 different videos about a variable list of subjects. And when I look at them, I notice that I have grown in my ability to talk about biology concepts. So for example, I now am able to talk about proteins in terms of Arutiawera Adero, I talk about cells in terms of vero. I talk about receptors in terms of tumirago tuadero. And in general, I am learning how to talk about biology in Gikuyo. So I think my initial aims are certainly being achieved. Additionally, 
There are some few favorite videos that I have made that are really really close to my heart. The first of which is the one that I made about diabetes which was requested by one of the viewers. The second was about coffee rust which was also requested by one of the viewers and interestingly this viewer was himself a coffee farmer and so then what he did is he shared this video with his community which is very very meaningful to me. The third video of interest has to do with RH incompatibility and this video was important to me because I made it in dedication to a woman who I met who had been dealing with RH incompatibility. So the quick backstory is I met this lady when she came to the city that I live in to get treatment for herself and for her unborn child both of whom are dealing with the consequences of RH incompatibility. One of the leaders in the city that I live in held a baby shower for this lady and at the baby shower she shared her experiences and one thing that was apparent was that there were many people that she knew in her home community in Kenya who were dealing with the consequences and the problems related to RH incompatibility. As you can imagine, this is very stressful for the women and the small children and their husbands and the fathers of the children and the families around them. And since recovering from her pregnancy and since delivering safely, this lady decided to become a civic science educator specifically about RH incompatibility. She shares the resources that she has learned and she helps to amplify the basic biology concepts that she has learned to explain this disease to people around her. And I was very, very inspired by this choice and I decided to make this video to support and empower her and to encourage her in her efforts. I should say at this point that while all my videos are in the Gekoyo language, they usually have English subtitles because again, Gekoyo is only one of 40 plus mother tongues in Kenya and one of over 2000 languages on the African continent. And so what I try to do to increase access is I usually have English subtitles alongside every video. Reflection number three has to do with the role that heritage can play in how we learn and how we understand different amounts of information. And so this topic is near and dear to me, obviously, as someone who is teaching about science in my mother tongue. And I think a really, really beautiful and elegant explanation of this concept and of the ideas that I think I, ex I hope to explain is this journal cover from the journal Cancer Cell. And on this cover, what you see is a stage of several characters. At first, you might think, hmm, these are random cartoons. But if you read a little bit more about this cover, what you discover is that these characters are from a Chinese novel, a Chinese 16th century novel called Journey to the West. And this novel is very, very important in Chinese culture. And so this is a story that is well known if you are a person of Chinese heritage or who is existing within Chinese culture. Importantly, what these artists have chosen to do is to use this story that is well known in a specific culture to explain experimental findings that are found in this journal. And I thought that this was such a beautiful example of how different types of knowledge can be used to support and encourage each other to help further human understanding. What does this mean? What the artist does is they use each representation in this image in parallel to a component of the experimental findings. And I've made a video about this, so I will encourage you to go listen to that. But in short, what the artists are doing is they are using art and history to support the teaching of science. And that is essential because oftentimes there is discussion of the competition between STEM and humanities and how they are one is more important than the other. But I think that in reality, both STEM subjects and humanities subjects are important and work together to help us understand our human condition and understand each other and understand the world around us. And so this video I think is important and this reflection in general is important because it reminds me about how different types of knowledge work together to further our understanding. Okay, looks like we are on reflection number four. So in this reflection, I want to talk a little bit about mother tongues and how they are perceived with a focus on how they are perceived on the African continent. 
So because there are many countries on the African continent that were colonized, what happened was that the languages that the colonizers brought with them are the ones that have higher precedence in terms of how people consider education, how people consider upward mobility, and how people consider what is proper and what is right. So you might imagine that this is definitely something that is a very historical problem and has no relevance to date. I would say that that's not exactly the case. If you look at this Daily Nation article, what you see is that in this instance, two children were punished for speaking their mother tongue of the Luo in school. Furthermore, when you consider the fact that many youth don't speak their mother tongue anymore, and many parents don't teach their youth the mother tongue, and also, the fact that many people consider mother tongue to be unsophisticated or behind, this tells you that indeed some of these scars are still present. I am not a social scientist, therefore I don't think I have the range to have a very deep conversation about the role of mother tongue in the psyche and psychology and identity of African people, but there are many many people before me and around me who have written and thought and theorized with far more wisdom than I have, and their names should be scrolling on your screen right now. And I recommend that you take a chance to read the work and the writings of some of these people to better understand the role of mother tongue on the African continent, and to better understand some of the psychological chasms that can emerge when you exist in a certain language while concurrently having the language that you were born speaking or that represents who you are is considered less than. So this is a very important topic that has to be addressed and has to be acknowledged whenever one is discussing concepts of mother tongue and education in mother tongue and most importantly modernization of mother tongue. I should make the distinction that when I say modernization I'm not trying to say that mother tongue is inherently backward. What I'm saying is that our languages have to be used currently for current topics and for topics as we discover them and oftentimes we find that that is not the case. We find that our mother tongues are relegated to social contexts and never for technical concepts. If you consider the number of people who live in rural parts of Kenya, for example, that is a sizable number. A majority of those people speak their mother tongue. So if we do not develop our languages to talk about modern concepts, then that ends up stratifying people as a function of an access to current knowledge and current technology. And so, I think this discussion of mother tongue, who speaks it, and how modern, current knowledge and education is stratified alongside those axes, I think that is a very important point to consider. Alright, so at this point, we are on reflection number five. And so this reflection card has to do with the topic of multiplicity of languages. And so on the African continent, there's over 2,000 languages that are spoken, and when we talk about mother tongue and development of mother tongue, oftentimes it's very easy to imagine that that is entirely an academic argument that really has no realistic context whatsoever. And then, if you think about all the different mother tongues on the globe, certainly it doesn't seem practical at all. So when thinking about this concept, one thing that I usually think about has to do with the fact that our human body contains over 200 types of cells. Those different types of cells are assembled into different organs, and all of those organs have to work together for the functioning of the human body. Humans are made of thyroids, and pancreas, and liver, and kidneys, and muscles, all of which are very different types of cells, right? However, all of those cells have to work together in order for the body to be healthy and to function and continue living. And so in that environment, the diversity is not a problem. In fact, it becomes an asset because when you consider the human body, the human is much more evolved than many single-celled organisms like the paramecium, for example. I mean, I'm not saying the paramecium is bad or that it's... I mean, I'm not trying to make fun of it. I think what I'm trying to say is that we are a little bit more evolved than the paramecium and some of that has to do with the fact that we are multicellular organisms, aren't we? And so the point that I would like to communicate is that diversity of languages doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. What we can do is simply acknowledge that all of these languages exist and that all of these languages hold very specific cultural components and then we can decide to develop these languages so that everyone who speaks them has the same amount of access to information and knowledge and understanding. 
And I think that this is an important nuance and an important point. Okay, our next reflection is, oh, number 5B. Okay, there's a number 5B. So in this reflection, I want to acknowledge that on the African continent and in many countries on the African continent, usually there's a history of tribalism. And this means that certain ethnic groups historically have been prioritized over others and have led to quite a bit of contention and quite a bit of erasure. So some tribal groups will kill the other type or they are, will diminish or denigrate the other type or the other different ethnic groups. And so there is again a hierarchy. And so many children have grown up seeing this and many youth have seen this in their parents and in their adults and in the world around them. And they decide they don't want to associate at all with mother tongues because of the division that is caused. Furthermore, when you come to the diaspora, there is sometimes this concern about assimilation. Many parents don't want their children to learn their mother tongue because they want them to assimilate into the country that they have moved to. And this is entirely reasonable, right? When you immigrate, you want to assimilate and you want to find a way to contribute to your new home. And so it is entirely reasonable that parents want their children to assimilate and they don't want them to deal with their mother tongue, which does not have a very direct economic benefit, nor does it have a particular upward mobility opportunity or incentive. And so in many instances, people decide that it is simply not worth the effort and the time. Interestingly, the media company Africa No Filter recently conducted a study where they surveyed 70 youth between the ages of 18 and 28. And when they asked these youth about how they considered African identity to be for them, what they found is that these youth talked about the importance of language as a key marker of identity. And so I think this reflection is just to say that, again, the topic of mother tongues is very complicated and nuanced, but it does seem that mother tongues and understanding the language of where you were born and where your parents were born still is an important marker of identity, and it is an important marker of where you fit in and where you belong. And because this study is conducted by people who grew up in the diaspora, who are first generation immigrants and beyond, this tells you that this is actually more apparent when you are farther away from home. And so that's an interesting piece of data and an interesting thing to know and understand. I've linked the study below so that you can read up more about it. This next reflection card has to do with the idea of deficit thinking. So in short, if you happen to be away from the continent, but you have some type of association to it, either through the fact that that's where you were born or maybe that's where your family was born typically you get to a place where you want to make a contribution to your home country if you live in the us the uk france etc sometimes it's very easy to fall into this idea of deficit thinking where you imagine that you have solutions that you want to contribute to the continent in the context of science engagement and science communication this means that as someone who has a PhD or someone who has been educated in the sciences, there's this idea that you have something to contribute to the audience and that the information flow is going one way. However, many communication scholars suggest that that is very, very far from the reality of how people understand and how people learn. The reality is that people are not this empty bucket that needs to be filled. Instead, People come with their own biases and their own understanding and their own cultural context. And if you want to make a sustainable contribution, you have to understand what that cultural context is. And so it's not just a matter of information flow where you show up and you say, people don't know, let me tell them, or people don't have, let me give them. Instead, you have to understand the cultural container. And in some instances, that cultural container can help you think about solutions and ways to deal with certain issues. Let me use an example. So in Central right now, one of the issues that are being dealt with is alcoholism. We've read many, many articles about alcoholism, and we've read of the fact that in response to alcoholism, leaders have decided to ban the presence of bars. And then furthermore, because now bars are being closed, there has now been the increase of illicit brews, which accumulate all manner of toxic compounds leading to death. And so this is a problem. This is an issue and the government leaders have done their best to solve the issue. And then now we have another issue. So from the side of a scientist, I would think, and actually I did think, and I have this video draft, 
I thought, before you need to make a video talking about the impact of alcohol on people's brains, on people's um, microbiomes, on people's livers, and you need to make sure that people understand the impacts of alcoholism and alcohol consumption, and you need to link all the information that you have. I even found this podcast by the neuroscientist Andrew Huberman about the impact of alcohol, and I had that linked and I was ready to go. And then I paused and I wondered, what are the odds that so many people are dealing with this issue simply due to lack of knowledge? Can I spend some time thinking about the cultural context in which this problem is occurring, and can that teach me something about the problem? So I found two things to help me understand and reframe my thinking. The first was this map that was made by this organization called Green String Network, and I have, in case I've messed up their name, their, their information should be here. And what's interesting about this map is it shows you the impact of intergenerational trauma, specifically in the Kenyan context. And as one of the symptoms that they hypothesize this trauma emerges is alcoholism. So it's not so simple. It's not just an issue of people understanding. There is a very historical context for why people are using alcohol to deal with problems. Another example has to do with this TikTok that I found by the content creator and historian Wairimo Mokoro. And so Wairimo Mokoro is a historian who makes TikTok videos and she spends a lot of time reading and talking to elders and people that understand historical context of Ikoyo culture. And what she does is she makes these educational videos. And in one of the videos she talked about alcoholism in Ikoyo culture. And she talked about how historically the reason or one of the ways that people understood the situation of alcoholism is that the individual did not have the right relationship with the uncle, specifically the uncle related to the mother. So basically your mother's brother or someone in that area or someone in that uh, relational environment. So at first you might think, what does that have to do with alcoholism, which we know is a disease, we know it is a series of patterns, we know it is a series of neurochemical triggers that lead to these behaviors and what does that have to do with anything and furthermore you are a scientist why are you thinking about these type of topics and this doesn't help you understand the molecular biology of the problem but if you pause and imagine what could the culture the people who practice this culture what could they mean here consider that perhaps it's not about the uncle having some type of um, blessing or some type of curse Consider that maybe it's the fact that if you have an uncle that you are close to, that means that that is an extra level of support. What that means is that if you have an uncle with whom you have a productive, uplifting relationship, that is an extra spot or an extra point of mentorship, an extra point of encouragement. When you think about some of the problems that people deal with in their 20s and in their 30s, that is a very, very contentious time for many people. People are dealing with figuring out what they want in life, figuring out how they want to move forward, how they want to build their families, how to deal with concerns about what they're learning about the world and how to develop themselves and what their future looks like. That is a very contentious series of years. And so what if the presence of an uncle who can support you provides an extra amount of support as you navigate these issues? What if it's not about a curse from your uncle but about the fact that someone who has walked before you can help you have some perspective on the issues that you're dealing with right now. This means issues of helplessness, issues of hopelessness, issues of not knowing what to do, issues of not knowing yourself, issues of not knowing what to do, how to do it, who to do it with, which family to build, with whom to build a family. These are all issues that people in their 20s and 30s deal with. And these are all issues that need support, they need encouragement. They need encouragement of a community, they need encouragement of a mentor. And so what if this tradition or this way of thinking is simply pointing out the importance of community in the development of young adults? So in that context, it's not just about information, it's not just about knowledge, it's not about shutting down bars, it's about thinking about who is this that is drinking what issues are they dealing with? What support can we build up around them to help them not use alcohol as a coping mechanism? And so that made me rethink my video and that is why that video is not up. I'm hoping that if I put it up eventually, I will be able to integrate maybe a conversation or two or some more information to talk about this. Or maybe I will just make sure to introduce or include as many resources as I can, not to just frame the issue as a biological problem, but a social problem. 
All right, so at this point we are at reflection number seven and this has to do with the fact that I need to be clear that not all translation work is in fact deficit thinking. So if you look at this example from a study in rural Ghana, what you find is a team of researchers who went to this part of rural Ghana and they wanted to study the incidence of this disease called elephantiasis. This disease causes a swelling of the extremities. And what they found was that when they talked to people about how this disease is caused, many people told them that it had to do with curses, it had to do with jealousy, it had to do with all lots of different things that had nothing to do with the reality of the fact that it is caused by a small parasite that is transmitted by mosquitoes. So in this context, what is necessary is to make sure that there are words for this parasite, words for the molecular biology of this disease, and some time that is spent having conversations and discussions with the people of this community to make sure that they understand the biology of the disease where they are. It's important to uh, start with where their curiosity is. So where is their curiosity? You, need, you have to listen to what they say and so start from there. So if someone tells you it's a curse, then it's important to talk through what is a curse? What does a curse mean to you? And then pose a potential alternative and then have that conversation in the person's mother tongue. And so that requires a very intentional commitment. The other point has to do with the fact that if we are not doing these type of conversations and having this type of discourse in our mother tongues, what that means is our mother tongues simply get left behind. If you consider, for example, a topic like gene editing, it is very easy to get lost in the conversation of whether or not genetically modified organisms are good for our environment. One part of that conversation that we forget is the fact that these technologies are being discovered and, and understood and developed every day. It's important to understand the technologies that are being discovered right now. In the last decade, the field of genetic engineering has grown, it has exploded. And I wonder if we're not having these conversations in our mother tongues, we are not able to engage with some of this information that is being developed and understood at a very, very fast rate. And so in this instance, it's not about deficit thinking, it's about intentionally building so that we have access and equity across different languages. Okay, at this point, we have now reached point number eight. And point number eight has to do with the audience for this work. Some time ago, I was talking to my grandfather about the audience of this content. I think he was pretty excited to hear that this channel was motivated by wanting my grandparents to understand some of these concepts. But because my grandparents are in their 90s, they don't use YouTube, he wanted to understand who actually is going to watch this content. And so I was trying to reflect on what would that look like and for whom would this content be? So I think that the primary audience of this content is people who want to learn about biology, people who want to learn about how to talk about different subjects in their mother tongues, and maybe people who want to be encouraged in doing both of those things. That's who the audience is for this channel. The next reflection related to this, or within this primary reflection, is I was reading this um, strategic plan uh, that was published by the Ministry of Health recently about their strategy to deal with tuberculosis and other type of lung infections. And in this document, I found this structure that helped me understand the way that health workers are organized in Kenya. And what I discovered is that there is a tier of people who are called community health workers who are responsible for being at the forefront, the first responder of many people, especially in rural areas. And so then knowing that this group of people exist, I decided to research a little bit about who they are and what issues they deal with. And I discovered several narrations that talked about how there are actually very few community workers per certain in certain populations and that this job, while it is now acknowledged, has not been acknowledged for a very long time. And so, with this information, I was reflecting on the fact that as scientists in the diaspora, or as people who think about science topics, one way that we can contribute to this particular sector of the healthcare industry is considering translation of knowledge that we are developing and understanding that we are developing into mother languages. And this doesn't just mean that I sit here and translate, this means that I collaborate with translators based in Kenya to make sure that the community health workers are in a conversation with the most up-to-date and recent information. And this is one way that we can start to build a information exchange and information dialogue 
across different languages and across the diaspora. We often consider our remittances in terms of the funds that we send back to support our families. And so I wonder, we could consider remittances in terms of knowledge and remittances in terms of creating these jobs for people to translate and develop knowledge and updated knowledge about current modern science and modern health developments and understanding. I think that would actually be a really interesting and nuanced way to develop a type of work that has a very specific impact into the communities that live in Kenya and that exist in Kenya. And it would be a really great way to consider how we integrate different types of knowledge because many translators are experts in humanities topics. And so in this way, we are able to bridge the gap between humanities expertise and scientific expertise to have a productive outcome for the community that is being engaged with and interacted with. And so this is an extra nuance of multilingual science engagement and science communication that I think has quite a bit of potential to integrate and include diasporian scientists. And so we are at reflection number nine now. And this reflection asks me, are there instances of multilingualism working? And so I think to answer this question, I will point to a very recent example in the arts. So the Kenyan actress Jackie Vike has a new show called Disco Matanga, where she acts as the title character. And what she does is in this show, she has um, a brother who dies and then she is responsible for taking him up country for the burial. And up country for her is in Bihiga County. And so as you can imagine, this process is very, very complicated and is the basically the structure, the basis of the show because there are many adventures and many people that are involved in that process. Importantly, one thing that Jackie does is she has everyone who is speaking there speak the language that they would normally speak. So English and Kiswahili are national languages of Kenya and so both of those languages are represented. And then in the context where people would speak their mother tongue, she has them speak their mother tongue and introduces subtitles. And so in this way, people are able to engage as they are and reflect the culture in which they exist in. And so I think science engagers can take a leaf from her book. Is that the expression? They can use her example to think about ways to create multilingual content that integrates and engages people of different mother tongues and does so in a way that reflects the reality of life. I think the uploading on this video will either be on a Monday or a Tuesday and her show typically comes out on Wednesday. So I hope that you take a chance to go and watch it and celebrate a Kenyan actress who is reflecting Kenya as it actually is. All right, we are now at reflection number 10. This reflection is a reminder that this week has International Mother Language Day. February 21st is the day that has been denoted to celebrate and acknowledge mother tongues around the world. So I encourage you to take a chance to either learn about your mother tongue or go and learn about Mother Language Day. I thank you so much for your attention in today's reflections and I urge you to take a chance to listen to some of the videos on this channel. Please feel free to leave a comment or suggestion or idea in the comment section below. Thank you so much to all the people who have left me comments and suggestions in the time that I've been on this platform. I am so so grateful for you and I appreciate your contribution and the time that you took to leave me a comment. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope that you have a lovely week and that you take care of yourself and of the people around you. Bye!